All right. Can you guys hear me on Zoom? Yes. Hello, Mr. Giles. Hey there, sir. Hold on. I think I got you guys on mute. Hold on. Now I can hear you guys. I'm going to give a couple minutes and then we'll get started. Okay. Torture rack out of the way. Torturing people, old people this morning. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So let's start off with a little pop quiz. <laughs> no pressure or anything. You guys can relax, you can sit down if you want. Pop quiz. So I'll start with Natalie. Natalie, are you there? Or are you sleeping? Yes, I'm right here. Okay. What's the board breaking technique for a yellow belt? Hammer fist. All right. And senior yellow belt? Elbow strike. Green belt. Axe kick. Senior green belt. Uh, front kick. Blue belt. Ground up kick. And, um, I believe punch. No. No? Is it knife hand strike? Knife hand and roundhouse. Yes. Got it. Okay. Senior blue belt. Senior blue belt is side kick and punch. Okay. Red belt. Reverse side kick and back fist. And senior red. Uh the person can pick any. What technique? Yeah, they can choose any technique, but what? What's the criteria? The criteria? Yeah. What? What's the condition? Uh, could you explain that a little bit more? <laughs> The, the guys here understand. I don't know why you don't. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I mean, you can like, I mean, you can do any, any. Um, and how do I explain this? <laughs> I don't know. You're an instructor. You're supposed to be able to explain it. <laughs> they can <laughs> pick. It just can't be. Um, Mm. Hmm. Uh, so, anyone? It, anyone here? It just can't. It, it can't be unrealistic, I guess. No. Like they can. But it, no. It can't be a previous break. 
I don't know. It, it can be a previous technique if they choose to do so, all right? I mean, like for the There's kick, really like not a limitation off. to that. Right. Anyone here want to take a gander? Yes, sir. No, not the number of boards. The number of boards will change based on age anyway, so, all right. How about you, Jason? You're still thinking, a chance? Anything that you previous or anything that you've learned up to that point is an eligible technique that you can use. The criteria is, is that the individual chooses their own breaking technique, but they must perform on both sides. So if they choose a front kick, right, then they need to do front kick with both left and right side. If they choose a hammer fist, left and right side. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Yes, Chance. No. Um, so Chance's question was, does it matter if a step is involved? And the, uh, the answer to that is no. So if they want to do a skip side kick, then they can do a skip side kick. If they want to do a stepping up side kick or a stepping up reverse side kick, they can do that. It's totally up to them on what they want to do. They want to add a step to it. That's fine. If they want to jump through a burning hoop, right, and break the board, that's fine too. All right. I have no problem. They just have to do it on both sides. So if they're going to do right leg, if they're right leg dominant, it's going to be easier than left leg. All right. I, I want to do the burning hoop. Right. <laughs> That sounds cool. <laughs> sounds good, sir. <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure I get one one order. So when it comes time for your second degree test, we'll let's check. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that'd be cool. Yeah. So I don't um, have any hair to send off, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so at the red belt level, um, that technique is reverse side kick and back fist. But starting at the red belt level, all ages they have to break both sides. So they have to break both left and right side. So breaking criteria. If you're a teenager or older, you have to break left and right. All right. Um, if you're under, if you're 12 and under, you only break one side, one technique. So whichever, so you're just gonna. Most people do the dominant side for the board break. That's that's no, that's common. So, but when you're a teenager or a teenager and above, you do have to break both sides. That's the that's the one criteria to kind of keep in mind. Um, yeah, so that's that's what the board breaking. So, all right, Mr. Campbell, next question for you. Um, the three white belt kicks. Front kick, axe kick, round house kick. Good. All right. Uh, how about the two yellow belt kicks? Okay. Um, senior yellow belt kick. Uh, green belt kick. Senior green belt kick. Okay. Um, blue belt kicks. Double kicks, right? So typically, what are the double kicks that we primarily focus on? Uh, front, side and round. front side and round, right? And occasionally the round us hook. Yep, round us hook kick. Good. Um, and then senior blue belt kicks, uh, butterfly and tornado. Butterfly and tornado. Good. Um, what about the red belt kicks? Mm-hmm. Typically jumping kicks. Yeah, jumping kicks, typically. Now keep in mind too that we do have, um, there's a little bit of a variance on that for adults, right? Um, typically from a testing standpoint, they're not required to do the jumping. They can. We will have, like if they're testing with a, a kid, then we'll do the jump techniques, but they won't be graded on those, right? So from an adult standpoint, the really the requirement is just to kind of clean up the techniques that they've already learned, right? And then do the jump techniques to the best of their ability, but we're not gonna grade them on the jumping technique itself. So when you're, when you're testing someone and they're a red belt adult or a senior red belt adult, we're not gonna be worried about too much of the, the jumping in place kicks, like the jumping over side kick, okay? Now it's different at the senior red belt level where we do the one-step jumping techniques, right? So that they will be graded on. The one-step jumping is a little bit different, a um, little bit easier to do because of the assistance of the momentum building. That technique versus trying to kick stationary and get up off the ground, 
can be difficult for adults. So when they add the step, you know, if they if they can do that, then that's a part of the, that we'll be grading them on based on that. So, all right. So keep in mind that the jump kicks or the jump kicks, the chunjin steps, those types of things are step techniques. So a jumping reverse high kick is considered a jump technique or a, a step technique. So when it comes time, when you're uh, grading someone for, from a testing standpoint and you look at the, the sheet, there'll be a section that says step techniques. And that's where you'll grade them for that portion there. So uh, it's not the kicking piece. All right. Um, Mr. Giles, I'll go with you. All right. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, terrible at these, but okay. Let, let, let's see. Uh, three step sparring. Um, the first block is what? For number one, uh, what's the block? The first block, let's see. Uh, it's an inside out block. Um, nope. Outside Maybe in no. block. Nope. <laughs> no, now you're guessing. All right. <laughs> first one is palm block. Okay. Number one is palm block, right? How about number two? Do you remember? I know it's been a while since you've done these, so. It's true. Uh, let's see. That one's going to be the inside out block, right? Nope, that would that would be the third. That would be number three. Inside out block is number three. Okay, so I got number three. I'm going to say knife hand block. Knife hand block is correct, right? So number three, you got inside out block. How about number four? Uh, let's see. Number four is a, uh, this is like the closed. No, that's the palm block. Uh, uh, let's see. Another inside out closed hand block, right? No, that's open number hand. three is that's, the inside the out hand. closed hand block, right? So number four would be the opposite of that. The outside in. The outside in block, yep. Yeah. How about number five? Rising block. Yep. And then number six? Uh, let's see. That's the uh, outside in block. Nope. As you step forward. Nope. Nope. Number six and number two are the same for the blocks. Number two was what? The uh, uh, knife hand block? Knife hand block. Yes. <laughs> so palm block, mess. knife hand, outside in, inside out, high block, and um, knife hand block. So. Yes. Okay, good. All right. So, all right. Go, Mr. Chance. It's been a while for you as well. <laughs> So no pressure or anything. Um, white belt philosophy. Ooh. Focus, right? Yellow belt. Enthusiasm. Senior yellow belt. Goal setting. Yep. Num uh, green belt. Self control. Senior green belt. Perseverance. Good. Blue belt. Mhm. Mm Starts with a C. Not courage, similar to it. Confidence, confidence, right? Okay, senior blue belt. You know, he's, yeah, it was brown belt back when you were there. Nope. Respect, respect. What? What about red belt? It's been a while. Responsibility. Senior red belt. Senior red belt. Good guess. <laughs> Yeah, senior red belt is almost black belt. Yes, you are correct. <laughs> <laughs> we have established that. Senior red belt is almost black belt. Yes. <laughs> Leadership. Yep. Good. All right. So, all right. Um, so yeah, um, the, the belt philosophies are important. Um, just kind of keep those in mind. 
Uh, we want to try to help, especially the younger students, the, the kids, especially. Um, for a lot of the kids, um, their parents don't always get involved. And so it's up to us to make sure that they're doing their studying. You might ask them, oh, yeah, go home and study your sheet. All right. A seven-year-old doesn't know how to study a sheet. Six-year-old doesn't really know how to study a sheet. All right. So it's up uh, to us to kind of give them those answers, those clues, and just kind of reinforce that. So if you got a little, you know, you got little Amir who's a white belt, you know, to help him remember, hey, Amir, what's the white belt philosophy? All right. And you tell him what the white belt philosophy is and say, I want you to remember that the next time I ask you. And every time you get a chance, you ask him to make sure that he remembers those. Because unfortunately, it's going to be up to us to help, help them with that knowledge piece um, until they get to, you know, eight, maybe nine, ten years old, and they kind of know how to study. But, you know, uh, grade school, you guys know, you guys have all been there, third grade, fourth grade. You guys don't really know what studying really is. You know, as you get older, though, getting ready for middle school, now you start to understand, oh, I have a test. I have to study. You understand that concept a little bit better. So um, some parents are actively involved and they kind of help with that already. That's great. You know, it makes it a lot easier. But keep that in mind with the people that you're working with. And some of these kids, you know, it's going to be up to us to help teach them the terminology and so forth. All right. All right, Jason. So. All right. What is chariot? Chariot. Oh, he, Jason's freaking out. Jason's panicking here. Attention, right? Yes. All right. How do we say bow in Korean? Kyungne, right? How do we say get ready? Yeah. Get ready. It's a little bit of a trick. You're doing Taekwondo. You've been doing Taekwondo for how long now? You don't know any Korean? Come on now. Jason, it's a stance with your hands in front of you. With your fist in front. Jumbi. Okay. So now, right? And I, I kind of phrased it differently. So I kind of threw him off, right? If I would have said ready stance, he would have been, oh, yeah, right? But really, the term chumbi in Korean means get ready. Chumbi. It's not really a stance, right? The stance itself is what we call narangi sogi, narangi. Narangi, which is parallel stance, sogi, all right? So just keep that in mind, right? It, a chumbi is really get ready. That, the word itself is get ready. And we're going to slowly start transitioning people out of that. Um, I'm going to also slowly transition when we do um, 10 basic stance. We're not going to use the English. We're going to actually use the Korean, all right? So muasogi. I like that. Right? Muasogi, close stance, right? So when I say chere or attention, right, that's just a command is what it is right the stance itself right if we're doing this as a stance is moasogi which is close stance feet together right moasogi all right you have moasogi in chirchan all right narangi sogi which is your parallel chumbi stance ready stance right you also have it in um yukjang right so Keep that in mind. And in Kumgang, right? When you come back here after the Santamaki. Right? Okay, so going on, Jason, you're not done. All right? Begin. Shijak. All right? Stop. Come on. Rest. Show. Huh? How about um, uniform? Tobak. All right? Uh, let's see. How about turn around? Tido toda. All right. So basic commands. Um, how about school creed? We haven't done this in a while because of COVID. What is school creed?
To Chang Hun. Uh, to Chang Hun. Right? We haven't done that one in a while. So, right? so these are the basic commands that we, you would do, right? If you were to run the entire class, right? So things like Chariot, Gyeongne, Jumbi, Shijak, Goman. So, right? Just a little pop quiz, just to kind of see where everyone's at. Right? Um, so things like knowing the kicks for each belt, right? That's important so that you know that when you're working with someone, um, you're helping them with their kicks, you know, to what level that they're supposed to be kicking to. Now, keep in mind, some people, some, um, some students, we will teach them a little bit ahead, right, depending on their progress. This is not the ultimate, okay, because they're a senior yellow belt, they're not allowed to learn hook kick until they get to green belt, no, right? If you see someone progressing really well, really quick, then go ahead, show them. That's fine. I have no problem with that, okay? Right, but I don't expect someone who can't do all the kicks very well up to that point. You're going to teach them that hook kick and start having them work on hook kick, right? When they, they can't do a front kick very well. So that's the key is exercise of discretion is just a guideline. The curriculum is a guideline, right? The guideline that we test to. So, yeah, a senior yellow belt might know a hook kick, but they're not going to be tested on hook kick at testing. Does that make sense? All right, so. Um, it it kind of gives you the ability to be able to continue to challenge each individual because we know that some, some people, they're going to pick up the white belt curriculum really quick. They're going to pick up front kick, axe kick, and roundhouse kick real quick. Okay, so you can teach them crescent kick if you wanted to. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Right? But then for others, the white belt curriculum is a struggle getting all of that information down. So that's why we have it there as a guideline. Okay. Typically with adults, there are, there are those adults that pick up things quickly, and then there are those adults that have a hard time remembering things, all right? And so that's why, you know, there's a lot That'd of- That'd be me. <laughs> what, what that, you said, sometimes adults have a hard time remembering. Remembering. <laughs> That'd be me. Right? Well, it's a, once again, it's a process, right? It's how does your brain take to the information, all right? Some people are very audio oriented. Some people are very visual oriented, right? So you, you can talk to someone and show them the movements or they can, you can give them a sheet that says, oh, here you go, LF steps to the right, you know, left foot steps to the right. And they'll know how to, and they'll understand that. Whereas others need to be like, you need to show me, don't talk to me, just show me the movement, all right? So, um, being able to assess that and being able to kind of balance that with everyone because everyone's learning style is going to be a little bit different in class. And so that becomes a challenge when you're trying to manage 10 people in a class and maybe two or three people on Zoom. So um, once again, you won't be thrown into that situation where you have to do both all at once, right? You'll do one or the other. You'll either focus on Zoom or you'll focus on things. And the reason why I talk about the Zoom piece is because the Zoom piece is not going away. COVID goes away, I'm still going to keep Zoom going. So just so that you guys are aware. Um, I'm going to market Apex as um, something that isn't limited by the geographic area. Okay, so I'm working on how I'm going to handle testings and things like that. But that's not anything that you guys have to worry about. I just want you guys to understand that. Um, there might be the occasion where you're going to be teaching class and you might have to do both. You might have to deal with some people here and deal with people on Zoom as well. So keep that in mind. Um, uh, but once again, you're going to get a lot of practice with it. Um, people understand um, that you're going through some learning curves. So we will preface a lot of that with, oh yeah, you know, this is, you know, uh, you know assistant instructor Chance or assistant instructor, Mr. Campbell. You know, they haven't had a lot of experience with this. Um, don't expect you guys to be able to go in there and go knock it out of the park first thing, first time around. So, um, you know, Natalie gets a lot of practice, unfortunately, you know, unfortunately for her. Um, so she kind of got thrown to the wolves pretty quick. Um, you know, Ms. Green's been doing this for a little while. Mr. Daniel will have some struggles as well because he has never had to deal with a, a, a Zoom issue. It's always just been in person. For you guys, you guys have the in-person, the in-person stuff, you guys do fairly well. It's being able to balance both. That's going to be the challenge. So, um, so kind of keep that in mind 
once again, um, spend time each week just studying the curriculum, going through it. I know that you know it, but then go and look at it to make sure that you know it correctly, All right? Because the last thing that you want is to be accused of teaching something incorrectly or, uh, yeah, that person taught me that when I go, that's incorrect. You don't want to be that person. <laughs> so, um, because the automatic response when I tell a student that they did it wrong is they're going to panic and they're going to go, they're going to they're want to blame someone. So, and it's going to be usually the person that taught them or who they re last remember. So, um, and it's not that I'm trying to come down hard on them or anything like that. It's just that panic reaction because I'm the, the head instructor, All right? Um, everything that I do, it's like almost they, they panic and freak out. You'll hear that all the time. Like they'll be doing something fine. I'll come over right by them and then they start to freak out and then they do it wrong. And they go, you need to move away from me. You're, you're, you're making me nervous, All right? And you'll start to find that out too, right? Mr. Campbell, you'll find that out when, because of your size, your sheer size. And when you come up to little kids and so forth, it becomes an intimidation thing, right? Because they're just scared of your size and, you, you know, and, and so forth. Yeah, right? And that may, it does make it a little bit intimidating. So um, the way we approach. And then for you guys, the issue more so you, you guys and Natalie is always because of the fact that you guys aren't adults yet, right? they're your friends, they want to be your buddies and so forth. And they don't necessarily know the, the distinction or the, the line between you're an instructor right now and you're their friend here, right? Because when you're, when you're, when you're on that gray area there, then it's hard to get that respect that you need. Uh, um, for, uh, for us, for you guys, you know how to turn it on and off, but a kid does not. An eight-year-old doesn't know that they, they shouldn't be, hang, you know, hanging on you, you know, and doing things like before class and so forth. They should really be, you know, if you're in the school, they should be treating you with respect. They shouldn't be calling you, hey, Chance, right? They should be calling you, excuse me, sir, Mr. Chance or something. They should be addressing you. And a lot of times you'll also hear me. I'll always use the Mr. or the Miss ahead of their name, right, to try to create that habit so that they know that, we are misters and misses, right? So, because um, that's, that's one of the things that Taekwondo is lacking today is the, the respect. And once again, I don't want to go back to the old school style of respect, which is the extreme measure where automatically when I walk into the room, everyone should be stopping what they're doing, right? The head student or the highest ranking student that's in the Toljang should be gathering everyone to bow to me. I don't believe in that philosophy. That's a cult-like thing. Okay, I'm, I'm not trying to create a cult, but you're going to notice I'm going to try to utilize. I'm not going to utilize your first names, right? Mr. Campbell, Mr. Yurkowitz, Mr. Dason, uh, you know, Mr. Dason or Mr. Morgan. I'm going to try to utilize more of the name. Now, with the kids, it's going to be different. Mr. Isaiah, Mr. Nirav, Mr. So-and-so, Mr. Ben, those types of things. I'm going to utilize the, their names, right? Part of that is one. You need to know their names, <laughs> right? You need to know the people that you're working with, what their names are, right? And the good way to do that is to constantly reinforce. Good job, Mr. Ben. Good job, Mr. Amir, Miss Alice, whatever it is. Because um, that, that was the one thing that was hardest for me when I first started teaching was to remember everyone's names. And I do a good job now because I see them every single day, right? I deal with them the moment that they walk in the first time to – them actually being on the floor. I see them all the time. For you guys, it's a little bit harder. You don't see them every day. So it's important that once you hear me tell them their name, then you use it a lot when you're working with them. All right, Mr. Ben, that was good. All right, Mr. Ben, that was good. That way it helps you to remember so that when you see them in class next time, hey, Mr. Ben, good to see you. That is correct. Yeah, absolutely. With Zoom, it's totally different. Yeah, that's the other thing too. All right. Because you're a little box. That's the other thing, right? You're a little box. So, so some of the things that you're demonstrating as well, you might have to get up really close, right? If you're demonstrating a hand technique, right? And you're back here. Okay, let's do front kick, back fist punch. I want your back fist to come from here, from the hip. Uh, we've been talking about this lately. So from the hip up, right? The people on the Zoom can't see that very well, right? Mr. Giles, were you able to see my hands very well? 
Nope. No, not really, right? So then yeah. we have to come up here, this right? Is better. You know? Yeah. So here to here. This is the motion. Right. Right. So utilize that resource whenever you're in that situation. And then kind of think about that as well, like when you're teaching one on one or with a group. When you demonstrate it, you know, you might be demonstrating it this way. Where's your audience back there? Right? They don't necessarily see everything that's going on. So you might have to do it from a side view. Okay, let me show you from a side view. All right, one, two, three. Do you guys see that? Does that help? All right? You might need to do it facing them. All right? Part of it is understanding you know, where everyone is positioned because if I'm doing it this way for the Zoom people here, right, the people behind me don't get to see all of that. Right? They don't see my picture on the screen up here. All right? So we might have to do it a second time this way before we actually get started. All right? Anything that you guys do, you should try to demonstrate. Very important to demonstrate the technique. All right? You don't have to demonstrate it high, but demonstrate it properly. So if you're going to teach them front kick, right? then you teach them front kick. Okay, let's work on picking up that knee, extension, retraction, put it down. All right? And maybe that's the first thing that you do is you just work on this part here. Don't worry about all the little tiny details like pointing the toe, you know, straighten out your ankle like you're wearing high heels, all of that stuff, right? Once again, the three phases of learning. Learn the movement first, right? Then we work on the detail, right? Then we add the speed and power, right? So when you teach someone something, movements, teaching a pumse. Don't go through when you teach a pumse and go, okay, you're going to turn to your left. You're going to go into a walking stance. Make sure your walking stance is three foot lengths deep. When we do our down block or our low block, don't start, um, we want you to start from the shoulder, bring it down to your leg. We want to make sure that the arm is parallel with the top part of your thigh and your front leg. Make sure you're resting hands on the belt. All right? That's too much information. All right? Just teach them, turn to your left, low block, walking stance. Step and punch, all right? Get them to be able to do this without having to think. Once they do that, then we can start talking about the detail, all right? And once again, different levels gonna get different level of detail. And that's the hardest thing to do, all right? All of that stuff that I did when we talked about, that's good for an adult. An adult can process that, a teenager can process that, all right? A black belt can process that. Eight-year-old black belt can process that. Okay. A white belt who is six years old, even though they can do this pretty well, can't process all of that yet. All right. So we have to we have to think about what we want them to do. All right. What is the key purpose of doing the pumse? All right. We want them to learn how to move. So we want to make sure that the foundation is always strong. So stances are the first priority. Okay, so when you're teaching pumse, kicking, whatever, stance is the first priority. Make sure they have a good base, standing. Okay, that's the first thing. All right. Then the second thing, right, that we can talk about is the, the, the technique, the block. All right. So we want to make sure that in order for a block to be effective, it needs to have motion, range of motion. So if they're doing a low block, right, we want them to not do this. I see a lot of this for low block, right? It looks like they're punching, right? We want to make sure they're coming from the shoulder down, shoulder down. That's all we want, all right? That's the start. So, right, for Ben, that's what we're working on is just, just do this, all right? I'm not worried about this hand being here, all right? Get this part down first, all right? So if we can see Ben, who is six years old now, right? Just turned six or seven next week, yeah. So one, right? So we wanna see Ben, who's getting ready to turn seven, we wanna see him be able to do a low block like this, right? We don't want him to just go like this, right? Or if he, right? Because are, these are all incorrect, right? This doesn't do the block justice. So we wanna make sure, right, he's starting here and coming here. And if this hand's dangling, that's okay for now, all right? Once he gets this done, then we can add something else to it. Okay, make sure this hand's here. But it's a process, right? And I'm learning this too because on my Pumse team, right, who are supposed to be my uh, athletes, the ones that are detail-oriented, right? I've got five and six-year-olds, 
right? That I'm trying to train in the same manner as I do my teenagers, all right? And the problem that I run into is, right, a five or six-year-old can't process all that information, all right? And then what happens is that when I have other people, other members of the Pumse team teaching them, they're doing the same thing. Okay, Master Hong told me I need to make sure, you know, pinky on the top, thumb on the bottom for my low blocks. Right? And that becomes too much for a six-year-old, right? Like Swojus, right? Cora becomes too much for them, right? So we have to think about, okay, right? They're not going to be able to do it the same way I do it. All right. So I need to get them as close to that as possible. So how can I do that? All right. This is probably the closest thing that we can do. If we can get them to start from the shoulder and come down, then we win. All right. So we work a lot on things like for little kids, right? Let's have them try not to move so much. All right. That nervous habit. All right. You've seen kids that, that do that, right? When they kick, right? Looking to the side. So what do we do? How do we correct that? Or how can we help them, right? Let's get them to kick and put it down instead of trying to jump and kick, right? You know who does the jumping, right, Natalie, in class when they kick? Like the, like when they kick, like they kind of go forward. Yeah. Who does that in class? Jacob. Uh, yeah, Jacob, right? Jacob, the schoonmaker, right? He's the smallest kid in the class, but he covers the most amount of distance, right? In two kicks, he can get from here all the way up to the camera. Two kicks. Because that's all we're doing in class. We're doing two kicks forward, two kicks back, at most three, because of trying to accommodate for the people in Zoom. All right. But yeah, so he's one, he likes to hop when he kicks. And so you start to watch different people and go, okay, I'm going to give them one thing to kind of work on and do that. With adults, you can do multiple things. Some adults are like, don't like that though. It's too much information. <laughs> you know, you got those adults that get in one thing and then they lose something else. It comes out the other side, something they lose. So you tell them to do this. And then last week you told them to work on this. And then when they do this, now they're just doing this again. So you have to be careful because... Every person is wired differently, right? The biggest thing that, uh, that I want you guys to really focus on is just the technique, right? So as we're doing things, whatever it is that you're doing, right, demonstrate proper technique. So go back to if you're working with someone with a front kick, right? Mr. Campbell does a good job of this. When I, was, when I had him work with Gretchen yesterday on tornado kicks, right? He kind of broke it down for her to kind of get her moving a little bit more fluid because for, for Gretchen, she was a little bit, she's very choppy with her movement. It was, you know, kind of hop, 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 and then boom, all right? And what, what do we want to see? We want to see that fluid, solid, one kind of movement without any breaks, all right? But on top of that, right, that's, that's the first part, right? Getting the movement down. What's the second part of tornado kick, all right? The kick itself, right? The kick itself. What happens a lot of times is when people do tornado kicks, right? They'll do the kick. Right? They just drop the kick. Once again, think about what's the kick? What is the kick on a tornado kick? What is that kick? It's a roundhouse kick. Right? So what is the roundhouse kick supposed to look like? Right? It doesn't look like what I just threw on a tornado kick, right? Right? It should be basically when I do the tornado kick and then place down, right? But if you teach that part first, then they, they never get around to the end, right? You'll see a lot of people always kicking over to the side, never getting to the target. So you have to learn, we have to get to the target first, right? So when we do that, teach them to turn and spot the target and then throw the kick, right? Stay on the ground. Because anytime, everyone wants to be able to get up in the air. That's the Right? You watch any little kid, they want to do tornado kick as a white belt, as a yellow belt. It's a cool kick. It's awesome. All right? But right? they want to, they they instead of crawl and then walk and then run, they just want to go from coming out of the 
out of the womb to running a marathon. Just they want to skip everything else. And you can do that, but then the technique suffers. All right? And that's the thing. We want to make sure that we're teaching that proper technique step by step to kind of help them through that process. And for everyone, it's going to be a little bit different. All right? It's always going to be a little bit different. All right? You learn differently than the person next to you. All right? And so think about that when you're working with people. If something doesn't work or something isn't sticking, then you need to maybe change your approach a little bit. Okay. Um, one other thing in regards to teaching that I, I kind of want to point out is all right, most everyone here is pretty tall. And when you're working with kids, it gets a little bit intimidating, right? And they're always like this, all right? So sometimes it's good to kind of get down on their level, try to get eye to eye with them. So if you're holding a paddle, you know, if you can do it like this, that really helps. Um, helps with the, the intimidation factor that they kind of experience, all right? So, um, especially for adults, it's really key, all right? It, it's, it, you're already intimidating as it is with your mask on, with your, you know, your eyes, your beady eyes, and, you know, your haircut and your massive size and so forth. So, you want to make sure, because of the fact they don't see you every day, that's the other thing too, right? They don't know you. They don't know anything about you. To give them that sense of, okay, relax, you're going to be fine. Um, I'm a nice guy kind of thing. Um, you know, if you can get down to their level, that really helps to kind of ease their psychological apprehension that they might have. Not, not to say that all kids have it, but majority of the kids, when they're dealing with someone that's very taller than them, it's, it's already intimidating. So, and that's something that I've learned at Lifetime. Uh, even because me, I'm not really big in stature, but I've seen kids react to me negatively when I'm standing and talking to them like this, even though I'm using just this tone. You know, they're, they're scared. So, I, you know, I, I'm always getting down here, and that makes it a lot easier for them. So, all right. Any thoughts, comments, or questions in regards to that? All right. So, um, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about focus pad, focus paddles, all right. so, and how to hold these things. Because these are great training tools. And also kicking shield. So focus paddles are good for typically those fast kicks, front kicks, axe kicks, roundhouse kicks, hook kicks, crescent kicks, right? Those are, that's what the paddle's good for. It's not, it's not great for like side kicks and reverse side kicks, right? You can use it for targeting purposes, but this is really what this is. This is a focus target, focus paddle. Right? Focus, right? Focus on where that is. Get your foot to that target. Okay? So when you're holding this, right, what I always recommend is when you're holding the paddle, right, you want to make sure that the laces are facing the person. Right? So whoever is kicking, that's, that's the direction you want to hold it to. So, right, right here, I'll be holding it this way if my person is here. Okay? The other thing, too, is I like to grab up kind of by the fat fatter part instead of down by the very edge okay and what it does is it gives you a little bit more control of the paddle versus here it gets really floppy and it puts a lot of extra torque on that wrist right when especially when people are kicking hard and you're kicking the very edge and it's also susceptible for getting kicked out of your hands okay when you're in up a little bit closer to the the meatier part or the fatter part right it gives you a little bit more control right um, the only problem is that I know there's always a risk that you're going to get your fingers kicked. All right. You got someone that doesn't pay attention, sloppy kickers, whatever. Then, you know, they kick down, down here in this section of that paddle where your fingers are and usually get kicked. All right. So as a paddle holder, right, a couple of things to keep in mind. <laughs> so when you, when you get that grip in there, you can you, you could utilize the, the elastic strap if you want, if you don't have a good grip, all right? If you don't have good grip strength, all right? If you don't have good grip strength, you got to start doing um, fingertip push-ups, work on that grip, all right? But yeah, if you need that for that, okay? So, but when you hold, typically what I like to do is make sure that you're not locking out your arm and holding straight like this, 
okay? Because we, we don't want to put extra pressure on the, um, on the elbow joint or anything like that, or the wrist joints. So we want to make sure that there's a bend, right? Shock absorber, bend in the elbow a little bit, all right? And then from here also too, right? Instead of holding it straight up and down, right? Just add a tilt to it. So you're going to tilt it just a little bit, okay? So this is good for a roundhouse kick. Isaiah, come here real quick. You're fine. All right. So come here real quick. Okay, if from here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to just tilt it toward the, his kicking leg. There, right? Okay, so go ahead and try again. All right. Okay, and so hopefully what's going to happen is that he's, he's focusing on the meaty part of that, that paddle. Okay, and part of this is where you place it. Right, so if you want them to do a roundhouse kick, let's say at stomach level, then put the meaty part at the stomach level. So don't don't tilt it like this. Okay, don't tilt it like this because once again, now you're putting strain on your wrist. Okay, your wrist is going to be strong in this position here, like when you when you have a fist, right? So it's the same thing. It's like grabbing a fist, right here, right? So you just drop down to that level there, boom, and that's going to give me more control than trying to hold it like this here because this is going to put that strain on that wrist, okay? So bring the hand down and keep the meaty part up. That's what we want, okay? Now, part of this is timing. Part of this is also timing, right? Kids love, people love the sound of that, right? Gives you that reinforcement, oh, yeah, I hit it good, All right? My kick is good, All right? When you hear... Right, that sound it doesn't it doesn't give you a lot of confidence, right? And that's usually because why? A couple of things when they're doing the kick. You, this happens with roundhouse kick a lot, right? Some people snap too early. They snap their kick out and then they swing it. That causes the thud sound, right? When you hear this sound, that slap sound, that's when the extension and the contact are at the same time. Timing. Right? That's being able to time the knee coming up and the extension to the target. That's that timing, how well you do it will determine how strong or how loud this paddle gets. All right? So if you're late, then you're going to get a thud. Right? You're going to get more of a thud sound. All right? You're going to see also people who don't pivot and they're going to end up hitting with their big toes or the side of their foot. All right. One of the things to find out if someone's kicking right or wrong is hold this and have them do 10 kicks while you're holding it. And then look at their feet. All right. As long as they're not dark skinned, right, you're going to be able to see little redness on the spot that they're, they're making contact with. And a majority of the people that do roundhouse kick, they're going to get contact on the side of their big toe because they don't pivot enough. All right. We want to make sure that the contact is more so on the instep, the top of your foot. That's where the contact should be when they're hitting pad paddles. Okay. So when you're adjusting height, you know, just move the elbow and the arm low and high. All right. So this is for roundhouse kick. Um, you can do it for reverse spinning hook kick, hook kicks. All right. You can with hook kicks, you can go vertical straight up. You can do roundhouse kick this way, right? But you need to make sure that your, your per, the person that's kicking knows how to turn their hip over, okay? Because if you hold this vertically, right, and they have the roundhouse kick where they don't like to pivot, right, you're gonna, they're going to feel it really bad in their toes, right, the side of their big toe. So, all right, part of this is also trying to minimize inju injury when they're kicking. So your ability to kind of tilt Tilt this paddle this way is going to be much better for you and the kicker when they're kicking, okay? Um, when you're holding for axe kick, right? So when you're holding for axe kick, you're going to hold the bottom side of this. So make sure that the, the blade is on the outside. So I don't want to hold this way. If I'm holding with my right hand, I want the, the blade or the, the, the stitches of the paddle on the same side of the hand that I'm holding on. So I'm on this side, okay? And then we'll basically what that does is it positions your hand to the hardest part of the paddle, 
uh, where all the support is, which is along the stitch. Okay, and then so you grip it like you're doing a claw, right? And you hold it up like this, and then you just kind of bend the elbow for the angle, or you raise the angle for the however high you want it, right? And for those people that are doing axe kicks when they're hitting the paddle here, right? We're typically working with the, the bottom of the foot, the toes. Slap that slap motion. Okay. If we're going to have them work on for breaking purposes, then you're going to use a kicking shield. You, wouldn't use, you don't want them to have practice with the heel here, right? Because a lot of times what happens is they come in way too close. And if they miss, they're going to hit you as you're holding, all right? So this is more for just stretching purposes. Um, you know, get them to kick high and stretch and reach. So get those high kicks, you know, where the toes are just touching. That's okay. All right. You can also hold it in this manner for side kick and reverse side kick. All right. When you do those kicks, though, side kick and reverse side kick, you want to hold straight arm out. And then that way it just kind of flips this way. You see? Kind of hits into the arm if they kick too hard. If you hold it here like this, real close to your body, and then it's going to hit you. All right. And the other thing, too, is if you hold it loose and it comes up here and it goes flying out, then it'll come at you. So that's why, like I said, you grip tight, grip tight, and boom, hold it out. All right. They should, and then make sure that they're focusing on the meaty part of that paddle, the meaty part. All right. Tell them not to kick up high. Kick, kick the lower section. That's where it makes the most noise. Okay. All right. These are great tools for you guys if you need to buy time. Like, oh, I don't know what to do. Just grab some focus paddles, all right? Get them in the line. Boom, 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 and just kick. If you've got some tall people in the class, maybe have a couple of them and break them up into smaller groups, all right? And then just have them kick, all right? Um, try to avoid, if you're teaching, if you're the one teaching, try to avoid holding for a small group while the other group is doing something different. You know what I'm saying? So make yourself available. If you can, try to be the person hey, let me show you how to hold this, right? And then hold it, have them hold it, right? And then that way you can go around and still watch and monitor, okay? Um, and then if, if push comes to shove and you're the only one that can hold, then you hold, and then you make everyone stay in your line. And then that way you can give them the feedback as they're kicking, all right? So um, now if it's a situation where you've got some – Little, um, you know, if you've got black belts in your class or higher ranks, yes, get them to hold. They need leadership opportunities, you know, and to practice and so forth. And then you can work with someone, let's say the higher ranks or whatever. Like for you, Mr. Campbell, if you've got some teenagers, you know, you're not going to have Isaiah hold for the teenagers, right? So you can hold for them. Say, hey, okay, teenagers, come over here. You guys work with me for just a little bit, all right? And spend about five minutes, five minutes just kicking, all right? So you can do same side, you can do opposite side. Um, if the class is small enough, you know, you can do up and down the rows, right? You guys have seen me where I have you guys do the drills where you have two holders and one person in the middle getting tortured, right? You can do that drill too. Nothing wrong with that, right? And it's just, and once again, this is what's, what's the purpose of this? Focus. Get your foot to the target. I didn't say get your foot to the target as hard as you can. Just get the foot to the target. That's really what we're trying to do with this. All right, your ability to get to wherever you need to go, right? It's the same thing, right? If I'm board breaking, I need to get my foot on that line. Do you have the ability? Can you get your foot on that line? Slowly, yes. With a little speed, it gets a little bit more difficult. So it takes more practice. So this is a good tool for that. Now, when you're doing power kicking, all right, this is what you want to use, power kicking. Shield, kicking shields. All kicking shields have the straps in the back. Some will also have an additional strap at the top, all right? But most of them will have this strap in the back. And what you do is basically you wrap both, you wrap your arm, whichever arm you wanna use, you wrap it through both and grip to the opposite side, okay? So you're not gonna grip it like this, all right? This is not what we wanna do. We don't wanna use two hands and two grips. We wanna use one arm and grip it, and then use the other hand to support. That's where that top handle usually comes in some of these, right? Okay. And the reason for this is because why? We don't wanna be out here like this. 
Because once again, they're going to be kicking hard. So what's going to happen if, when, if they kick low? It's just going to flip through and they're going to fall down. All right? So what we're doing is we're utilizing our body. This is, what, this is why we call this a shield. So you get your arm into it. You place it along your side. You tuck it in up against your body. All right? And then you brace. You get into a deep front stance and you brace. You brace for impact. All right? And then let them kick. Boom. Absorb and relax. All right? Okay, so one, two. But if your arms are out in front like this, then guess what happens? Everything comes crashing into you, and then you get shock, all right? Here, you don't get shock at all, right? Your whole body absorbs everything. So you don't get that jerk or anything like that. When it's out here like this and it comes in, that's where you get the jerk, and then right, you, you run the risk of pulling a neck muscle or something like that, all right? So once again, same thing, right? You're not going to have Isaiah hold this for chance kicking, <laughs> all right? All right? Chance is going to destroy him, you know, get him flying to the Pikes Peak from here, all right? So, uh, nor would I have days on hold for Mr. Campbell, all right? Mr. Campbell, how much you weigh? 200. 200? Yeah. So, yeah, one, right? Because days what, what are you, like 115, 110? You don't know, somewhere around there, right? Okay. Like for me, I'm, I'm about 145, right? So I, I'm still giving up 50 pounds to him, but I can hold for him. Right? I can give him a good target to hold for. And this is good because why? At some point, right, you guys run into situations like with the bags, you kick real hard and it tips over. It doesn't give you good feedback, right? Sometimes here, this gives you a lot of good feedback because you get resistance to this, right? If I, if I had, right, you want to throw a kick real quick? So real quick, I'm going to have Mr. Campbell just do a roundhouse kick. Let me just have you throw a roundhouse kick here. Just, just light. Go ahead. Okay. You can get harder as you want to. There you go. See? And you see, I'm not getting that jerk, right? If I hold it out here and it kicks, right, then what's going to happen? Go ahead and throw a kick, right? This starts to collapse. Right? I take a lot more brunt, right? If I keep everything tight up against my side and go ahead and no, – your hip into it sir come on all right see right it doesn't really do a lot to me right all right i i feel a little bit but all right we all feel a little bit all right but i'm protecting myself once again my hands up top to kind of push this out and have it right up against my body if i just do this right if i'm just doing this then this is going to come hitting my head all right and the other thing too is we we don't want to be scared holding paddles and holding this. Because anytime you start to do this, right? Let's say I'm scared of him, right? Go ahead, right? So when he kicks, you see, I move it because I'm flinching. I'm nervous, right? That causes injuries, right? He can overextend, hyperextend something because he's not hitting a target. He's thinking he's hitting a target to get resistance, but he, because you jerked it back, he missed his target. And then he hyperextends something. So we want to be, be careful with that. And it's the same thing here. This is, this is notorious. People don't like holding this. I love holding this thing. This is better than that, right? Because my fingers don't get crushed or get kicked, right? Can't kick my fingers here, you know? I don't, you don't, you're not strong enough to get through this whole bag to kick my fingers. So I feel okay and safe behind this, all right? But once again, not everyone is built for that. So, you know, anytime you got Mr. Campbell on the thing, yeah, hey, Mr. Campbell, why don't you hold this for some of the kids, all right? Ch Chan, same thing, all right? I'm not going to say Natalie to do it unless Natalie's doing, working with, you know, maybe some of the girls, um, some of the littler kids. That's fine. Jason, same thing. I'll have you hold for, like, Isaiah, but I'm not going to have mm -hmm. you hold for Chance, all right? It's just it, it would be too much for you, all right? So I'd be holding for you, Chance. I'd be holding for you, Mr. Campbell, all right? So because I'm – you have to you have to know how to take hits when you're taking this thing, so – just something to keep in mind. But another good tool, once again, for power, kicking power, side kicks, stepping up side kicks, reverse side kicks. But you also have to learn to absorb these movements, right? So you want to make sure you feel that, right? If they're kicking, boom, you absorb it. Don't just stand there and, okay, do that, right? Because 200 pounds versus 150 pounds, right? He's got 50 pounds more weight. That's a lot. He's going to push me back. It's, he should. All right? So, 
All right, um, any sir? questions? Yes. So uh, what's your experience with uh, the paddles and the targets for like little kids, like little, like white belts? Is it all right to let them to hold, to let them hold it? And, I would uh, recommend probably not, not the white okay. belts. They just don't have enough experience. Um, okay. Even yellow belts, I would say probably try not to if you can, if you can avoid it. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe have them work with you. Right. Um, you can do that with adults a little bit. Adults are a little bit more easier, but with kids especially, I would try to mm -hmm. avoid that as much as possible. Because, um, okay. you know, I, I would just avoid having kids hold for each other impossible because it becomes a game. <laughs> I, I see a lot of this. Come here, Isaiah. All right. <laughs> Isaiah and I are seven years, eight years old, all right? Okay, it's Isaiah's turn to kick. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> all right, come on. And then, you know, and then he's trying to kick faster. It becomes a game. Right. All right. If you're supervising, that's different. You know, if you're right there with them, that's one thing, all right? But sometimes if you've got like two white belts and they're holding for each other, chances are it's going to end up being... All right. Okay. Either one kid's going to accidentally get kicked or they're just going to mess around and not allow the other person to kick. So. Makes sense. Thanks. All right. Yeah. So. All right. Great question. Any other questions? That's really all I have for you guys today. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything else. Um, now do you have any questions? No. Okay. Jeez. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't mean to wake you from your nap. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sleeping. Yeah. Okay. God. I know you're not now. You just woke up. All right, <laughs> Mr. Giles. Any questions, sir? Uh, I'm good. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Good. Any questions here? All right. That's good for today, you guys. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. You too. All right. We'll hey, see you. Bye. Guys. Bye.